a on February the 10th. The next one will be on February the 16th and they're both from noon to one. Um, so that's the plan is to have a second meeting on the 16th. Um, from noon to one as well. We know that it is an overlap potentially with some other meetings and this is going to be recorded and we'll get that out there for people to listen to as well. We'll we'll record the one on the 16th also. Um, so we have a pretty full agenda today. Um, the process would be to uh, hear the presentation and we'll take a few minutes for questions, but then we'll probably move pretty quickly into the, the next presentation because of course we packed our hour uh, tremendously full um, as usual um, for this meeting. So thank you all for being here and uh, uh, we'll get going um, this morning. And first uh, we will start with uh, Ryan Patch. He is our, um, uh, he is our agriculture and climate and land use program manager for the agency. And he's going to talk about uh, the climate action plan for Vermont and dairy farmers. So we'll get started. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, uh, Diane. Uh, can you hear me? Um, glad to be here, everyone. I am here in 10 minutes to share uh, an update about a year long process and a 200 page uh, initial climate action plan for agriculture. Um, are we seeing a, a title slide at this point in time? Excellent. Um, so I'm going to uh, breeze through this uh, relatively um, quickly. Uh, we'll put my contact information in the chat. Please feel free to reach out if I can answer uh, any additional uh, questions. I uh, like to start this uh, conversation by orienting us to the current uh, state of Vermont as it relates to uh, terrestrial land cover. Uh, over 94% of Vermont is covered by natural and working lands. 12% of that is agriculture. And these lands are incredibly important for the state to meet uh, resilience goals as well as mitigation goals, uh, reaching out to uh, the 2050 net zero target set in the Global Warming Solutions Act. To orient us to the initial Vermont Climate Action Plan, there are three sections within the Climate Action Plan that are most relevant to agriculture. Uh, the, the reference is here, so please feel free to take a look. There's many, many pages there, uh, as well as um, uh, information, of course, about uh, every other sector that's included in the uh, initial climate action plan and the strat pathway strategies and actions to meet Vermont's climate goals. Um, the Global Warming Solutions Act was passed in 2020, and we know from uh, the Gunn Institute for the Environment update to the Vermont Climate Assessment that a climate action plan is needed as Vermont is getting warmer and is seeing more precipitation over two degrees Fahrenheit increase in temperature and a 21% jump in precipitation. When we step back to look at the national context, we know that climate impact isn't distributed evenly across the country or across the world. Uh, and where food is produced and distributed uh, today, um, we can see that there are disparate forthcoming impacts projected for different regions of the country, whether it's water stress, wildfires, or extreme heat. Uh, Vermont is in a region of the country where there is expectations for uh, increased precipitation over time and actual observed precipitation has increased as well. But one thing I wanted to bring to this group's um, attention is by 2050, there are projections that indicate that our summers will be drier, that we'll be getting most of this extra precipitation, perhaps on the edge months. But during the growing season in Vermont, um, there may be future climate risk uh, and the need to think about how um, water needs are met by uh, crops and livestock. Those that have been following the state's efforts to improve uh, water quality will know that soil health has been a major focus by both USDA and RCS and the state of Vermont. And this focus on soil health is um, a tremendous advantage that agriculture and dairy farming has moving into implementation of the Global Warming Solutions Act. Uh, a focus on improving organic matter and soil health can yield to 
Um, you know, as indicated here, aggregate stability within fields to prevent the erosion and loss of um, soil itself from extreme precipitation events, as well as the ability of soil to act as a sponge to uh, hold water when we need it and allow it to infiltrate when we don't. And so the focus of our soils was a, a, a big priority of uh, the Agriculture Ecosystem Subcommittee, which was the subcommittee created uh, as part of the Global Warming Solutions Act to look at agriculture and other natural and working lands. Resilience on farms is certainly one very important consideration, and I'll touch on that uh, in more detail in a minute, but also acknowledging that how farmers uh, manage and how many of the fields in Vermont are situated means that there is a, uh, also a, a, a co-benefit or opportunity for um, agricultural lands to be recognized for the, the ecosystem services they provide in uh, preventing downstream infrastructure damage. Uh, the study on the right-hand side of this slide from UVM uh, talks about how the wetlands and floodplains um, upstream of Middlebury prevented significant damage in, um, the, the, in Middlebury itself. Uh, now we know from um, we, we know that 50% of the floodplains and wetlands in that watershed were managed by farmers, and the cost of the flood on crop damage uh, isn't really considered in this, these findings. And so, just acknowledging that um, there are liabilities for agriculture and opportunities for uh, agriculture to be uh, acknowledged for how you know, where land is situated um, in. Uh, our watersheds can have an important impact on climate resilience in the sense of preventing uh, infrastructure uh, damage. So to bring us back to the Global Warming Solutions Act and the initial Vermont Climate Action Plan, there are mandatory emission reduction targets established in the GWSA. Uh, and so when I talk about mitigation, uh, I'm using that term as defined in the Global Warming Solutions Act uh, as it applies more appropriately to agriculture and how agriculture, yes, of course, has emissions of uh, greenhouse gases, um, but it also has the ability to sequester uh, and reduce emissions from the same unit as land, of land. So mitigation is, of course, a big part of the Climate Action Plan, explicitly emission reduction. But also, in the same sentence, resilience is an important consideration as well, both for farms themselves and food production, food systems and distribution and food security, as well as watershed and flood resilience, both on farms and within watersheds uh, as you know, climate in, uh, exacerbated uh, extreme weather events happen uh, in Vermont. The Agriculture and Ecosystems Subcommittee really focused on agricultural soils as a major leverage point for farms in Vermont to both provide mitigation services and improve resilience, uh, both for their farming operations and for their neighbors. Now, this isn't the whole story. There's many other uh, pathway strategies and actions, including the initial climate action plan, but I wanted to highlight agricultural soils um, because it is the process by which the adoption of conservation practices, which many dairy farmers are very familiar with through the recent emphasis on the state's clean water work to adopt cover cropping, to adopt residue, uh, no-till and reduced till, um, opportunities for increasing uh, prescribed grazing and rotational grazing, all of these adaptation strategies for water quality also have a co-benefit for climate goals. And so where on an acre of land cover crop is applied, that can both sequester carbon, where no-till is applied, that can reduce emissions, and through the improvement of soil health by the adoption of those two practices as an example, farmers can improve their drought and flood resilience and potentially decrease input costs over time, improving their viability. So there's, there's incredible opportunity in the soils of Vermont um, to help agriculture meet uh, the climate goals of the state. To take a moment to emphasize um, 
the work that farmers have been doing to date, uh, the 2021 Clean Water Investment Report shows that the six-year average for agricultural phosphorus reductions, uh, agriculture is responsible for over 96% of those phosphorus reductions. And this comes through their participation in state and federal programming that supports the implementation of conservation practices. Uh, so that 96% has come from over 300,000 acres of implementation since 2016. And the initial climate action plan called out the need to use the current state and federal process leveraging and capacitating uh, that system to quantify climate benefit. Um, there are many mitigation benefits, as I've uh, talked about briefly, from the adoption of many of these conservation practices and ensuring that the current system that is, that is in place is recognized and quantified was one of the uh, first recommendations in the Climate Action Plan uh, for how to get at sequestration and mitigation benefit uh, from agriculture. One unresolved uh, issue within the structure of the Global Warming Solutions Act and the Initial Climate Action Plan is the, you know, you hear the talking point, uh, agriculture is responsible for 16% of greenhouse gas emissions in the state of Vermont. Uh, and that is true when you look at the gross emissions from the following categories um, uh, highlighted in red. Uh, below. What, what I'm attempting to communicate here is that this 16% is inclusive of uh, enteric fermentation from cows and other ruminant animals, uh, how manure is managed and stored, uh, as well as uh, from some crop uh, you know, residue and how fertilizer is applied on soils. What's not a part of this slice of pie is the sequestration that happens in agricultural soils. And so reconciling that agriculture is a sector that both can emit uh, and can also sequester, um, that is a area of work that is ongoing and, and hasn't yet been uh, resolved, but I just wanted to briefly um, bring that to uh, this group's attention. To zoom out for a minute, um, I only have one more slide left after this. Um, to a recent announcement this week from USDA, a really, I think, substantial uh, opportunity, a billion dollars in funding uh, to pilot climate smart agriculture uh, throughout the United States. Um, the Agency of Ag will definitely be looking at this as they are looking to leverage those practices that provide greenhouse gas benefits and or carbon sequestration. Top of the list, cover crops, low and no-till, nutrient management, all of those same practices that have been you know, highlighted in a part of the water quality effort being recognized for their uh, climate benefit. Uh, within uh, the governor's uh, budget uh, this year, um, the uh, part as part of the um, National Working Lands uh, mitigation strategy includes a, a five million dollar proposal for uh, agronomic practices in the state. This would be in addition to uh, the water quality uh, budget, uh, and it's a, an incredible. Um, a capacitation of uh, many of those existing programs at the Agency of Agriculture. Also proposed was a uh, uh, million dollars for the Payment for Ecosystem Services and Soil Health Working Group, which is really looking at how to quantify ecosystem service benefit from the improvement of soil health. And there's a significant nexus to uh, the climate goals uh, of the state. So I will uh, pause here and I appreciate the opportunity to share this update. Uh, there's, of course, much more within the initial climate action plan and many more details within each one of those strategies. Um, but I, I appreciate the opportunity to bring this um, before this group. So thank you. Thank you, Ryan. So Ryan has to uh, go off and chat with a legislator at 1230. Um, anybody have a burning question for Ryan? If not, he provided his contact information and you can email him. Any specific questions? And it, you might be muted, so check to see. All right, hearing none. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Laura DePietro, and she is going to talk about uh, water quality rulemaking. So thank you, Ryan, and Laura, take it away.
There we go. I think you can hear me now. I'd hit the star six. All right, let me share a screen. So I only have a few updates and I must say, I was looking at the list of participants and it's a really fun list. There's a lot of folks I haven't seen in a very long time. So it was fun to look at that, so welcome. Okay, so the title of this is Water Quality Rules. So the first thing I wanna give you just a quick update on is just a few of the rules that right now are in different stages of process. So. The first one is the RAPs, which I think a lot of you are very familiar with, the required ag practice rules. And so we shared a lot, oh, I wrote 2011, in 2021, <laughs> we shared a draft with everyone um, of a draft that we're working on that basically has technical edits in it. So minor fixes that as the agency has tried to implement the rules that they are today, we've identified a few changes that are needed. And then the biggest part that's in it is a technical service provider. So these are folks who write nutrient management plans. That is an entire section that the legislature gave the agency authority to regulate those people. And this is going to include that regulatory framework for them to become certified as technical service providers with the agency of ag. There's one more component with the draft that was shared last fall that is not in there, which is the wetland aspect. So the legislature also asked the agency of ag to revise the RAPs to include wetland components that are not otherwise regulated by ANR. And so we're still working with ANR in that space. And as soon as we have that piece ready, that's when we'll start the rulemaking process. Um, and I apologize, I don't really have an update on timeline on that at this point, but my guess would be maybe this summer. The second rule that we're working on, we have it completely drafted and it's the BMP or the best management practice rule. And so, the cost share program that a lot of farms are familiar with actually has rules behind it and they're old. I think they've been written last in 1995. And we had an audit by the state auditor and that was one of the requirements of the output of the audit was that we needed to revise those rules to catch them up essentially. A lot of statute has changed and those rules are not, we're not reflecting that anymore. And essentially what it comes out to be just for simplicity is it, it basically mimics what we do today in the program and how we work with farmers. Um, but it just updates those those items. So as soon as we're able to decide, I, you know, we can go now if we'd like to, we were hoping to do the REPs and the BMPs together and have one rulemaking process for both rules so that our public outreach was combined. Um, but we may go ahead and move with the BMPs all depending on when the REPs are ready. So um, stay tuned in that space for those two. Those are the two that are most likely and active to move within the next six months. The third one is the large farm rule. And this is something we've been trying to work on for years, frankly. Um, and we've actively picked it back up again. And our goal is by this summer to have an internal draft. And then we will start working with the ag community and, and having conversations uh, ahead of a rulemaking process. So sort of just to work out some of the details because it is a very complicated program. And it is something that, you know, I think um, a good conversation is necessary before we get to a final draft. The next big area aside from rules that I just wanted to highlight for folks that the agency is currently actively engaged in is this topic of food waste and agriculture. And essentially the connection between the two is that um, we have a universal recycling law in Vermont that suggests that we need to reduce our food scrap input going into the landfill because it is a compostable resource and a nutrient resource once, once um, either composted or digested. And then it's land applied. And so the challenge with that is not necessarily as much the food, it is the contamination that can exist within that. And so these are two reports that were just put out last year, last fall by EPA. The purple one is about contaminants. And so that's things like PFAS compounds and other chemical compounds that can be in the food. And then the, one on, the yellow one on the right is about the plastic contamination. Um, so just you can see there where, you know, we, we all recycle, but we're not always perfect. Um, I definitely look at my Casella guide all the time to figure out if it should go in the compost or into the uh, recycling or not. And so we're just not perfect as a society in, in how we manage our disposal system. And so plastic is getting mixed in with it. And so we're, we're following this um, because it's important. Once this stuff gets land applied to the farm, um, there's two concerns. One is microplastics, which can break down into nanoplastics which may be able to be taken up by plants 
And there's some research, a lot of the research is, is you know, dated 2021. It is all relatively new research, um, but we're starting to understand that it may be able to change the soil properties and the soil microbes and be taken up by the plants. And so just trying to understand that these risks might be there and you know, if it's land applied, it's, it's unrecoverable in many ways once out there in the landscape. And a lot of this, just why this became something that became attention was one, the universal recycling law and this diversion of food waste from the landfill kicked in more recently. And with that requirement kicking in that, that this food waste needed to be removed from the landfill, there's a depackaging facility that was created um, and it's in Williston. And essentially this diagram that I have here shows you, um, we, the little industrial factory, you know, that's where we make our food and we process our food. It gets to the home which then the, the garbage truck picks up. And once the garbage truck picks it up, it tends to take it to a couple different places. One, it might compost it, and the other, it might send it to what this depackager facility. Um, one arrow it doesn't really have here is that the depackager also is taking directly from the factory. So if someone produces um, a batch of material and it's off spec for whatever reason, but it already got packaged, um, they need to remove the, the food from that packaging. And so the depackager can do that. So it will process both your home compost, it will also process material that never was um, sent to the store for, for people to purchase, so they're depackaging it. And when they do that, the depackager essentially just, it, it's a, a system of just beating the, the material and separating out, because then it breaks the packaging and it breaks up everything and you're able to sort of auger out the plastics or cardboard containers, et cetera and use those um, to deal with in the, the waste stream appropriately. And then the food is supposed to go through the depackager, which then can get sent to an anaerobic digester to be further processed to kill pathogens and other things. And then it is land applied. And one of the challenges that we're learning, this depackager is new in Vermont, but the photo down there on the left with the science, um, this is UVM doing research. And you can see these are the microplastics that they're finding in this material. And so we just need to, we're all trying to catch up and learn. And the reason the Agency of Ag is involved in this is that we have a new program that was given to us that essentially this waste material can fall under. And so we're trying to understand, is this a good practice or is this not a good practice and how should it be managed? And so that's just a topic of area that is ongoing um, in discussion with the legislature and within the agency. Another big topic that I wanted to share with you, and this is the last one, just trying to give you big highlights. Um, is our paper performance program. And essentially, this goal is to create an opportunity and space where farmers who are meeting the targets that need to be met for the TMDL, um, it's based on Lake Champlain, the calculations of how we've dealt it with it, but we've extrapolated it statewide. So it, it is applicable to all farms statewide, but it sets those goals that once you reach a 40% reduction in phosphorus, anything you achieve above that, you're able to get incentives for. And so there's two different types of payments that the program sets up. The first one is just data. So uh, the data is generally a nutrient management plan for a farm, but taking that nutrient management plan data and putting it into the software that can calculate this phosphorus reduction, just doing that gets a payment of $400 per farm, up to $400 per farm or $15 an acre. And then you, you put it in when you do that that initial implementation of what your goals are for the year. And then once you've actually done your, your yearly work in the farm and you do what you actually did on the farm and then it's field verified, then you can put in that data and get an output that shows you how much phosphorus you've, you've reduced. And anything above that 40% target, you would get a payment of $100 per pound up to $50,000 per farm. Um, so this is a really large program, big effort to try. We've gotten $7 million. Um, a fair amount of it is going to build the software, which is already an existing platform, which we're expanding upon. Um, but a good chunk of it is to these payments. And so the hope is, is that we can have a better system of quantification of, of all the great work that farmers are doing and provide incentives for that work. And so here's just a, an example of it to give you some visual and an understanding of payment. Um, so in the bar, the full bar, if the farm, this is how much phosphorus the farm is able to, to they're, they're potentially losing. Once they deal with the green, which is meeting the 40% the threshold, and then if they were to do the yellow, which is to reduce another 20%, that 20% is what is eligible for the program, not for what's already required just to meet the target goals. 
And so that is where we would calculate if that was 172 pounds of, of phosphorus that was reduced, you would multiply it um, times 100 pounds and you'd get $17,200 payment each year. So, and so we're pretty excited about this program. Uh, Signups have just come in and we've got a number of farms. They're all different sizes, all different types. One limitation to this program, just to be very clear, is that it doesn't really work for pasture, uh, just based on the setup of how the foundation of the program was set. Um, the, the software program was set. Um, so it's an area we're aware of and we'll work on, but we're going to try and um, fine tune this, this general um, cropland area first. So that's all I have today to give you a quick update. Laura, you got one question in the chat. Is the LFO rule referencing the CAFO piece in DEC or something different? No, it is not referencing the CAFO piece. Um, the CAFO general permit, I have not had an update on that to know where that is at at this moment. Um, latest site we had heard was that it was sent to EPA for review and EPA was satisfied with it. Um, and DEC was going to then start the process of doing a public, um, putting it up on their bulletin for uh, issuing it as a permit. So going through the, the public process. That has not started to my knowledge and that, but that's where it was last at last conversation. Uh, the LFO rule is the agency of ag LFO rule. And our focus and goal is, is to just try and streamline it. Um, some of the language is, is challenging, confusing, and we'd like to make it more common sense, more straightforward and more efficient, um, less administrative and more you know, in the field and, and getting the work done. So that's our, our focus. Hopefully we can achieve that. Um, but yeah, it's all state. It's not anything to do, state agency of ag, nothing to do with DEC. All right. Thank you, Laura. If you could put your contact information in the chat, and if folks want to ask Laura questions directly, we'll we'll go there. Um, and thank you, Laura. Um, we have thank you. Uh, a little change in presenters. Uh, Catherine Durand was called away on from Agrimark on a, on a different issue, so we have uh, Nate Peabody here today to talk to us about uh, milk prices and market updates. So, Nate, I will let you introduce yourself further if you wish, but take it away. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, make it today and to talk to you guys. Uh, again, my supervisor, Catherine Duran, uh, is unable to make it today. She has a personal matter that came up, but uh, she wanted me to make sure to share with all of you guys that uh, she is very sorry she couldn't make it, sends her apologies, but uh, you know, life happens so uh so i will be here in your stead uh but but don't worry uh, our dairy market update that we're going to do today is actually the information that is really makes up the core of what my day-to-day -day work here is at agrimark um, i am one of our economists uh, my primary job is to do uh, economic and statistical analysis uh, for our department uh, keeping track of our supply and demand variables uh, and ultimately uh, producing our milk price forecast uh, that we produce every two weeks or so um, at this point. Um, and I'm actually gonna go into that forecast a little bit at the end of the presentation. Uh, but today, our first, we're gonna start with, there we go. First, we're gonna start with some, uh, talking about some supply and demand variables. First, starting with supply. And, and um, Nate, your slides are only showing um, not a slideshow view yet oh. to me. Oh dear. We can see them, but it's not slideshow yet ah. in what I'm seeing. Interesting. I can see it on my end. Hold on. Ah. Can you see now? Much. There it is. Good. Good to go, oh. Nate. Interesting. All right. So uh, hopefully you guys can see this milk production slide now. Um, we have been watching milk production change quite a bit in the last six months. Uh, as we started 2021, we saw milk production growing at above the 2% rate for the first seven months of the year, which uh, historically is, is higher than normal. Uh, we will typically see production closer to the 1.5% rate. Um, but in August that flipped um, and we started to see production fall below the 1% rate and ultimately uh, went negative in November at negative 0.02% and then uh, stayed right at zero for December, which is our most recent uh, area of data that we have. 
Uh, so what does that mean and uh, why is that happening? Uh, well, one of the major variables that is leading to our milk production uh, slowing in the US is the dairy herd size has begun to shrink. Um, now that's a relative, relative statement because earlier in the summer, uh, we actually had reached 30 year highs for the size of the domestic dairy herd. Um, so that we've fallen off that historic high mark uh, in the last few months, but we still have quite a large herd. Our herd is about uh, equal to where we were in September of 2020. So give or take 18 months or so uh, is around where we've come to at the end of December. Um, so we still have a, a good sized dairy herd, but we are starting to see it come down off of those historic highs. Now, production growth and declines have not been equal uh, across all states or across all regions of the US. Um, if you can see this graph on the left, it shows December milk production by state uh, in order of size. So you can see California is quite a bit larger than uh, the rest of the states and Wisconsin is semi-close, uh, but is still a pretty large distance behind California, but a good distance around above third, which is Idaho. Texas and New York are right about equal. Um, so we can definitely see that the areas of the country that have the highest production uh, are growing. Uh, and you can look see that in the right hand map, uh, which is courtesy of our friends at Blimling and Associates, who uh, we at Agrimark do work with uh, a good amount. Um, and we can see that California grew over 2%, uh, the Midwest around 25 to 3%, whereas the rest of the country uh, still negative on the year in December. Uh, so that just kind of shows that this production, uh, that the changes in production are not equal across the country. They are very regionally based. Um, and there are a number of reasons for that. Uh, lots of supply chain issues, production challenges, um, you know, all the things that we've heard about across the pandemic uh, throughout the US economy is impacting the dairy space uh, just as much as it is any other industry. Now, the U.S. milk production is not the only uh, area of the world whose production has begun to decline or to uh, flatline. Um, you can see in these two graphics here that we have the EU um, largely showing negative growth for six months. Uh, most recent data that we have is from November, uh, which is showing around a 3% decline, uh, whereas New Zealand uh, also has shown declines for about four months. Um, including their peak season in the Southern Hemisphere in October, November, December, um, all were below year-over-year uh, -year growth standards. Uh, so again, that international production is coming down as well. Combine that with the U.S. flatlining, and you can start to see why our prices have uh, begun to increase, or our forecast prices have begun to increase, because uh, we foresee that there will be less supply uh, on the marketplace, which will uh, ultimately raise prices and and we have started to see that uh, in the last few months and a, a very natural progression from talking about international milk production is to talk about our uh, u.s dairy exports now we have data from december which was just released uh, last week uh, by the u.s DEC uh, dairy export council and we now can look at a full 12 months of 2021's exports and in that time frame, we can we can see that exports were very very strong for the dairy industry. Total value was up 18% on the year. Total volume up 10%. Uh, both of those are very strong. Um, you know, this really was a banner year for exports uh, across the U.S. Uh, for dairy, and um, that goes for our all four of our pricing commodities, our dry commodities of non-fat and total whey. Uh, both were up around 10%. Cheese and butterfat also up on the year. Um, and that all comes despite the supply chain logistics and port congestion that we've heard so much about the last uh, year, year and a half. Um, so even despite those, those headwinds, we have still seen very strong export growth. Um, and that's very, very good news. And it is very encouraging for me as a uh, economist who's trying to forecast prices going forward. We have seen a strong demand uh, increase from our international marketplace, and that is only a good thing for our dairy prices in the U.S. Now, the one thing I want to point out for December, uh, the December data, is that we did start to see some slowdown in the dry whey and uh, non-fat exports, uh, our powder products. Uh, and the reason for that is that those uh, dry, uh, those powder exports 
uh, were really driven by uh, the demand in China for the past year. China has purchased a great deal of U.S. whey products and international uh, and or international competitors' products, uh, but that demand has started to come down in recent months. As you can see, the total demand from China went down 35% in December. Um, so we may be moving into a phase where there's a little less demand for those specific commodities. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, if we also look at the, uh, the other two columns in this graphic on the right, we see that Southeast Asia and Mexico continue to show growth. Southeast Asia and Mexico are traditionally our two largest export partners for the dairy industry. Uh, so continued growth in those, those regions of the world are, uh, are more, than, uh, more than encouraging as we look forward. So now that we've talked a bit about production and exports, I'm going to go more specifically into our classes and our commodities that uh, make up our class prices. This graphic here shows futures from two days ago uh, for class three and class four in the US. And really what I want to point out to you is that class four futures are very, very strong. Um, has, to a point where we haven't seen prices this strong in about 10 years since the 2013-14 range. Um, and in addition to class four, class three also looking quite strong going forward. Maybe not quite as high, but, but still a very supportive price. So let's look specifically at cheese first. As of close yesterday on the CME, uh, the spot price of cheese was $1.90, $1.86 for blocks and barrels, uh, which is strong. Um, if we look at historically, you know, the last two months of prices, you can see that graphic on the left here. Um, largely, for the past year, we've seen prices range between $1.50 for cash settled cheese and $1.80. Um, and in the past month or so, we can say that that range has maybe bumped up about 10 to 15 cents, but we're still seeing a range between 165 and 190. And as a forecaster of dairy prices, I expect that range to continue uh, as we go forward, um, as long as our market fundamentals stay the way they are right now. Now, these fundamentals that we're looking at are mostly on the supply side. We've seen production for American cheese uh, products, including cheddar, grow quite a bit in the last year. Um, 2021 was really a record year for production of cheese products, mostly coming from the new uh, plants that have come online in the Midwest, uh, the Glambia plant in Michigan being uh, one, for example. And while our production in the last two months has begun to stabilize in terms of year over year growth, we saw production December at negative 1%. Uh, that's still equal to that very large increase that we saw in 2020. So while that negative 1% seems like an encouraging number, um, it basically is telling you that production has slowed, but it's still quite high on a historic level. And if we look on the graphic on the right, we can see the impact of that high production. And that is that cold storage values for natural cheese have, have really grown in 2021 um, and are, are quite a bit higher than what we saw last year or in historic senses. Um, and so though large supply that is weighing on the marketplace is ultimately uh, keeping prices from really rising above that $2 range that we flirted with a couple times in the last year, but really can't break through because of the total supply that's on the marketplace. Now, the other product for class three is dry whey. Dry whey has had a very, very strong year and a very strong beginning to 2021. Um, it settled at above 180 yesterday, uh, which is strong. Uh, and ultimately, we've seen production of this product um, come down on the year. And that's really the, the dwindling supply uh, combined with international demand, which I was just talking about from uh, our export partners uh, specifically in China, but some other areas of the world as well, has really bolstered this price. Um, and for every one cent increase in whey price, you get six cents increase in class three. Uh, so if you were to look at what the average dry whey price was in the last 10 years, it's around 40 cents. So we're really looking at a dry whey price that's twice as high as what we normally do, uh, which gives us two to three dollars of increased support in class three, which has been very helpful for milk prices as the cheese prices have uh, ranged between that 150, 180 range. The dryway support has been very helpful. Now, if we move to class four, uh, butter is really our our banner uh, commodity that we've been watching this year. 
uh, the last month and a half since we've gotten into 2022. And that's because midway through January of last year, we saw butter prices reach all the way up to the 290 range, even a little bit higher on a few days on the spot market, which is extremely high. Um, we did see uh, prices fall off a bit from there. Uh, over a one week span, there was a 40 cent decline back to the 250 range, but it's the spot market price has stayed at the 250 range largely since then. Um, and, and that seems to be where uh, the price is supported by current fundamentals uh, as we look forward. Um, and, and as we look forward, as I said, we, uh, we can look at butter futures, which still have a, a bit of a decline. Uh, futures are, are settling more in the 235 to 240 range for most of this year and into quarter four of next uh, of 2022. And while that's still a very supportive price, it is quite a bit lower than that 290 range we were at earlier. Um, but again, we this is really a supply driven marketplace. So we're going to have to see how milk production responds in the first half of this year. Um, that's going to be a really, really large indicator on where our butter prices end up settling um, as we look at really what the total supply is both domestically and internationally um, uh, as we as we look forward throughout the year. Now, the fundamentals that I was speaking about for cheese are exactly the same for butter. Cold storage for butter has um, begun to really decline uh, in, in recent months. Uh, last year, butter, uh, butter values have really declined the last few months as production has begun to come down. Um, and, and as of December, which is our most recent data set, uh, production was 27%, or sorry, cold storage was 27% lower than uh, where we were in 2020 and about 5% higher than where we were in 2019, which is really a pretty good place to settle the year uh, given where we started. The final commodity for our pricing values and for class four is non-fat. Non-fat has had a great year. Same fundamentals as butter, low production and low storage is really increasing price. Uh, price settled yesterday at 187, which is the highest it's been in a, in a little bit. Um, and really export demand is what's been driving uh, demand for this product. Southeast Asia has had a, a very large appetite for our uh, domestically produced skim products, uh, non-fat and skim products, and that has really continued uh, throughout uh, 2020 and 21, and we expect that to continue through 22. Now, one of the last things I want to touch on here is the milk price forecast. Now, I mentioned before uh, I produce the forecast once every two weeks. Um, and on the left, I have a graphic, just a, a simple line graphic that shows the blend price uh, announced in Boston, um, where that forecast is looking um, from our most recent uh, forecast on the 28th, which was about two weeks ago. Um, we were expecting blend prices to plateau or to peak around the $23 range, but but largely stay above the $21 range throughout the next year. Uh, so the forecast average for blend price in 2022 is, is just under $23 at $22.60, which is actually about a $470 increase over where we were in 21. So that's quite a bit higher. Um, and so class three and class four, as you can guess, are both above uh, where we settled in 21, um, class three being at $20 and 55 cents and class four at 21 96. Um, and what that all means is that uh, obviously prices are forecast to increase. And if we convert that into our, our forecast DMC margins, um, we are expecting DMC margins to be quite a bit higher than where they were in 2021. Um, closer to the $10.50 to $11 range uh, for average margin rather than the $7.20 range, which we saw last year. Um, the one thing I want to mention before I get to our last announcement is um, we've been watching the class one mover. Uh, you know, I watch that every week as I as I do the forecasts um, just to see, um, you know, where the market is is settling where we're expecting the market to go uh, as we have discussions throughout the industry about pricing reform. Um, and through much of last year, the current formula for the class one uh, milk pricing was 
actually a benefit to our farmers, as in the price was a, was higher than it would have been under the higher of. Um, and that's because uh, the class three, four spread uh, was lower last year than what we saw in 2020, which of course was when the class three prices skyrocketed and uh, the class one mover was, uh, had a pretty large impact on dairy farmers across the country. Um, now, as we go forward, it does look like the higher of would be slightly more beneficial in the short term, but in the long term, again, the class three, four spread is expected to not be too large, uh, which will indicate that the current formula is hopefully going to be more beneficial to producing a higher price than the, than the old higher of. But again, we watch this every week. Um, you know, this is a big, big topic of conversation in the industry, so we're staying uh, up to date and informed. Now, my final, final point before we get to questions is risk management. Now, the DMC, the Dairy Margin Coverage Program for the USDA, uh, was just extended from uh, the sign up period was just extended from mid February to mid March, mid to late March, really. March 25th is the new deadline. Um, there have been a couple changes in the past uh, year that were announced uh, in December. One being there's an increase, uh, potential to increase your production history uh, to the 2019 base year, as well as there was an adjustment to the feed cost formula where the USDA is now using premium and supreme alfalfa hay uh, as opposed to a blend of hay, which uh, our numbers suggest is about a 20 cent impact on dairy margins. Now, if you look on the right, we do have a graphic that shows uh, all milk price forecast, feed forecast, and what the associated margin could be. Um, feed costs have been very high the last year, expected to continue to be very high uh, throughout this year. Um, so that that is still part of, or something to consider when you're looking at your risk management. But again, the prices are expected to be a little bit higher than last year, so uh, the margin should be higher. But all that being said, it's really, really important to still consider signing up for the DMC program, even if forecasts are indicating that some or many months may be above the 950 level. If we've learned anything from the past year, it's that markets and dairy markets can change overnight uh, and they can be very volatile. We expect volatility to continue going forward. Um, so please uh, really consider signing up for this program. Uh, as as an economist, as a dairy economist, I highly, highly suggest that everyone does this. Uh, as of two weeks ago, January 31st, Vermont was looking at about a 20 percent uh, total number of our, our dairy farmers under the program. Uh, I would really love to see that number come up quite a bit in the next month since our deadline has been extended. Uh, so please uh, you know, do your research, see if it works for you, but uh, I would really, really consider it. And uh, for anyone who's looking for additional coverage over the five million pound limit that the DMC program has, there are a number of other really good tools that can be used, like the Dairy Revenue Protection, the DRP program, um, other USDA programs for risk management. Um, so again, highly suggest looking into it. Um, and if if you do have any questions about markets or or anything like that, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, this is my last slide, so if there are any questions right now, I'm happy to take them. Otherwise, I will also put my contact information in the uh, in the chat so anyone can shoot me an email if they have additional questions. Milk prices, prices is usually where we have, where lots, we have of lots of questions. questions. Anyone have a question for Nathan? <laughs> Somebody's off mute. Do you have a question for Nathan? All right, Anson has a question. Anson, please. Um, yes, go ahead. Um, just something something to keep in mind about the uh, the insurance program. There is a bill making its way through the legislature that may possibly pay those premiums. It's still a little bit in flux, but it's making its way through the uh, legislature. And as soon as we get some finality on that, we'll message that to folks. But there could be money available for farmers that will pay to sign up for the program. So keep that in mind when we've got the extension, so it gives us a little more time to figure that all out. Yeah, and thank you very much for mentioning that. Um, and that's Vermont specific. So uh, yeah, keep definitely keep your eyes out for more information on that. Other questions for Nathan? 
All right, super Nathan, if you can put your information in the chat and folks could uh, email you directly if they have other questions, but thank you so much, Nathan. Thank you very much. Couple more things on our agenda today, uh, an update of the Dairy Business Innovation Center from Laura Ginsburg. Laura. Hi, Diane. Hi, everyone. Just going to pull up my screen here and we'll get going. All right, and Diane, can you give me a thumbs up if you can see it? Awesome. Thank you. Um, so I know many of you, um, for those who don't know me, my name is Laura Ginsberg. I'm the section chief of the development division at the Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets, and also serve as the center lead for the Northeast Dairy Business Innovation Center. Uh, the person who works most closely and devotes 100% of her time to the Dairy Innovation Center is Catherine Donovan. So if you have questions about it, you can reach out to either one of us. We'd be happy to assist you. So for a quick uh, background, the Dairy Innovation Center, we're now one of four USDA funded centers. California uh, received an award this year. So Vermont, Wisconsin, and Tennessee were all awarded in 2019. California joined the crew in 2021. And so there's now four centers. And to date, we've all been uh, awarded equal amounts of money, uh, exclusive of California at this point. We do send out about 50% of our funds as grants to dairy businesses. That is a requirement of the grant from USDA. So those dairy businesses are including farms, processors, and producer associations. And then we've added in some additional partnerships if they show a direct connection to one of those three eligible entities. And per USDA language, the focus of the work has to be on the development, production, marketing, and distribution of regional dairy products. So again, we were awarded in 2019. We're eligible for annual non-competitive funds through 2023, being a farm bill uh, based program. That's when we anticipate um, potentially having to reapply as a competitive center. To date, we've been awarded about $12.7 million in three rounds. We are well underway with round one, which is ending this year. Round two is in its second year and round three, we just received the funds in 21. So we're just a few months into that one. So the Dairy Innovation Center, it's for all dairy producers, cows, goat, sheep. Um, we've had a few inquiries about water buffaloes um, and actually one about camels. Uh, so anybody is welcome to the dairy table and processors of dairy products. And we represent the six states of New England, New York, Delaware, Pennsylvania, and New Jersey. We partner extensively across the region with other state agencies and departments of agriculture, state extension, dairy sector stakeholders, and then viability and business assistance organizations. We do our best to conduct um, engaging and frequent outreach and uh, represent all of the people across the region as best as we are able to with their support and participation. So the investment strategy for the Dairy Innovation Center has evolved uh, over the first couple of years. So we were awarded in 2019. We got state approval to start spending the money in 2020. Then COVID happened. And so really our first full year has been 2021. And in that time, we have learned an incredible amount. And so our investment strategy has been refined to really focus on the connection to consumers on farm, in processing, in distribution, and packaging, all of the things we do, we're looking at how do we position Northeast produced dairy products as being the number one thing that consumers will reach for. We wanna support business management so that farmers and processors can best understand their opportunities and capabilities of their own particular operation. Knowing that dairy is a cornerstone of rural communities in Vermont and across the region, how do these projects support and benefit rural communities and develop um, connections across producers and support other activities that are happening in those communities? And the fourth one is being a leader in climate forward production and processing strategies. So for a few highlights of project investments, we have a lot going on, um, so it's hard to cover, but happy to talk in depth with anybody else, with anybody who's interested. Um, so I am going to cover some of the projects and investment areas. So one way we invest money is through events and activities. 
We've done a number of different uh, opportunities that would fall under here. So we have dairy herd management technical assistance that's offered through University of Vermont. That's free for any dairy producer at any scale of any breed or species can access those services. We've got grazing transition. Uh, we're taking a group of farmers on a learning journey to Missouri. And we're about to go up to a, a international trade show in Canada to support value added cheese producers. So a lot of different things um, kind of spanning the whole range of dairy. And our project spotlight for this is the grazing transition cohorts, which we've just recently um, expanded this to be grazing transition, forage enhancement, and alternative farm management based on an, uh, an amount of feedback that we received that not every farm can graze their cows, nor do some farmers want to graze their cows, but they can learn um, methods and strategies to improve their homegrown forages, which have um, substantial impacts to the farm's bottom line and also to environmental management, water quality, and um, climate strategies. So our first cohort that we funded was through the University of Vermont with Cheryl Cesario that was in 2020. So they're entering their second year of services. She's been working with five conventional farms in Rutland, South Addison. Um, then we, we have another cohort that started from the White River Natural Resource Conservation District that's working with 13 conventional and organic producers in the Connecticut River watershed. And then a third one down in Pennsylvania that's in Pennsylvania and New York. And we just awarded four more. Those contracts are just getting started. So we're going to have a large number of people um, engaged in these services, which is really exciting. So one of Cheryl's farmers, um, Cleveland Farm, Scott Cleveland, he's from the original cohort, uh, has realized some substantial cost savings, $34,000 in the first year really excited about it, wishes he would have done it earlier. And that's similar to what we've seen from other cohorts as well, where they are experiencing feed cost savings, improved animal welfare, and just this real connection with other producers, which is how we designed and hope that the system would work. Then the other way we put funding out is through competitive grants. We've had a number of rounds of competitive grants, including agritourism, marketing and branding, specific funds for goat and sheep producers. We just closed the dairy food safety grants and we'll be launching this year two uh, or three new rounds, one focused on packaging innovation that's open now, and then we'll have farm innovation and processor innovation opening later this year. And those are for larger projects. Really exciting um, to be able to put out money and some big grants and see what people are interested in doing. So they're less bounded um, and more open to the ideas that are coming from the dairy sector. Our project spotlight here is the marketing and branding grants, and that's Lulu Artisan Ice Cream um, and Virgins in the background. We did these grants because we've heard repeatedly from businesses that they need assistance with their marketing and branding outreach to consumers. So we provided funding for things um, including brand strategy, labeling, e-commerce, social media, um, just really figuring out how they can put themselves uh, out there as best they can. So we awarded 13 grants totaling uh, just over $400,000. We had incredible demand. We received over 30 proposals for a request of $1.3 million. And so we're repeating this round again. It will be opening in a couple of weeks and then we're gonna do it again next year. So we've put about a million dollars towards it in our round three, just given the demand and the impacts. So the four Vermont grantees are Bridgman Hill, which is a goat dairy, um, nothing but curd, Lulu Artisan Ice Cream and Plowgate Creamery. So we've got uh, goat milk, cheese, ice cream, and, and butter represented there. Some of these folks have seen um, sales increase of 20-30% year on year, social media um, hits increasing sometimes upwards of a million or more um, additional hits to their account, so really meaningful impacts on sales and outreach. And then our last area is on research and development. So we fund a number of contracts um, to answer or help us uh, develop recommendations for specific projects. Right now we have a distribution network study that's about to conclude. We've done some work with goat dairy, um, goat and sheep consumer demand. Uh, we've got consumer studies happening and another one that's on um, specialty cheese quality milk. So 
lots of questions being asked and answers being developed, which is really exciting. The project spotlight here is one of our earliest ones that we did, which is a goat and sheep market demand. Uh, and this has been really important to get this information as the interest in either cow to goat conversions or goat startups continues to increase and the need for additional goat milk in Vermont, um, I think becomes more acute as that uh, sector grows. And so what this project did was we worked with a contractor and they did a consumer study and report, developed this interactive dashboard. So anybody who's trying to sell goat or sheep products to consumers can use this dashboard to sort by uh, the kind of consumer um, that they are looking for, the location, and understand exactly how much more they'll pay, what kinds of sizes they want, what kinds of products are interesting to people in different regions of the Northeast. So really compelling information there and a great report. We've had um, almost, well, we've had about 74 webinar views and 30 report downloads and a number of goat and sheep producers use this information to then receive the goat and sheep supply chain grant. So we're seeing the research feed into the actual projects and then have real outcomes as people are expanding their reach or projects. So current opportunities we have open right now, we have another contract round for that grazing transition, forage enhancement, and innovative farm practices. Those are contracts up to $150,000 for cohort delivered services um, regarding really anything about how you feed your cows and how you run your farm. So we're looking at uh, the innovative farm practices things that are not standard for the US industry. So what are what are people doing in Ireland or New Zealand or Australia that or Canada that may be compelling for us to try out here and to learn from? We're also thinking about things like how do you switch from a tie stall to a bedded pack or to a freestall facility in ways that um, are effective and efficient for individual operations. We also have two grants open right now, the multi-business agritourism and then the packaging innovation grants. So a snapshot on Vermont specific awards. So of all of the applications we've had open, generally just in 2021, again, because of 2020 being lost to COVID, we have received and reviewed 85 total proposals. And of those 40 came from Vermont. Of those 40 applications um, from Vermont, we awarded 24 of them, a total of 17 grants and seven contracts for a total Vermont investment of two and a quarter million dollars in a year. So really exciting to see those dollars going into Vermont businesses and technical service providers and the impacts that the funding is already having. So this is my contact information. I'll put it in the chat. We have a monthly newsletter we put out, um, so I'll put that sign up in there as well and encourage everybody to sign up for that because that's where we release all of our upcoming funds and project highlights and really interesting things that you can get engaged in. So thanks for the time today and I appreciate being able to speak with you all. Thank you, Laura. As you can tell, we're going to spill over a little bit over the one o'clock hour. Um, any uh, one question for Laura? Any questions? All right, hoping that you can hang in there. Laura, put your information in the chat. And the last but not least is uh, animal health rule update. Dr. Kristen Haas and Dr. Caitlin Levine, uh, Caitlin Levine, not Mark Levine, um, very important, are going to give you that update. So Kristen and Great. Kate. Thank, thank you, Diane, and thanks everybody who still is on for hanging on. I've been, I will admit, I've been munching into a bag of popcorn because I figure this is the 2022 version of going to the movies where you get to sit behind your computer and listen to your colleagues and, and co-workers give some great presentations. Appreciate all the information that's been shared shared uh, thus far in this meeting. And thanks, Diane, for hosting this in a, in a new world. Um, so I would like to start this brief update by introducing to you and then turning it over for a moment to Dr. Kate Levine. Uh, Dr. Levine has been with the agency since uh, January, so it's been a little while now, or excuse me, la last Gosh, we're over a year, January of 2021, and um, but I think it might be the first time some of you are virtually meeting her. So I wanted to introduce Kate as one of the other state veterinarians in our agency, uh, such that if you have a need to reach out to 
<clears throat> the veterinary group within the agency. Kate might be one of the folks that you are uh, talking with. So Kate, if you want to say a few words about yourself, that'd be awesome. Hey everyone, um, I'm uh, Dr. Caitlin Levine. Kate is fine. Um, I was a uh, mixed large animal vet um, for many years before coming over with a focus in dairy. Um, practiced primarily in Ontario uh, with with mostly small farm dairies. So as close to I think the Vermont majority, much closer to the Vermont model than the most of the out west farms. Um, I am, I've been here for, for about 13 months, which has been great, um, but I haven't gotten to meet most of you because of the situation being what it is, but hopefully that will shift here soon and I can start meeting y'all in person. Um, thank you for, for the last year. So far, it's been good for those of you I have met and the rest of you, I, I hope to be able to serve, serve this community well um, in, my, in my new role. And Kristen, you're on and, mute again. <laughs> and I was on mute. It has to happen once in every meeting. So uh, now you have a, a face with the name and um, feel free to reach out with us. I will put our, or maybe actually, Kate, if you would be kind enough to put our email um, contacts in the chat, that'd be awesome because it it's going to apply to the next topic, which is, as Diane mentioned, uh, a heads up that we are, for the first time, we meaning the Agency of Agriculture, for the first time since, I think, 1989, are in the process of updating our livestock import rules, uh, which will include, <clears throat> excuse me, dairy livestock species. And I'm, I've been amazed in the 14 years I've been with the agency how well a 1989 vintage rule has served us. It actually, the people who put it together at that point were very forward thinking apparently. However, it is time to update those. So we are embarking on that process uh, spearheaded by Dr. Levine. It's been great to have some um, a fresh enthusiasm uh, to get this project up off the ground. So we will be following the, the normal rulemaking uh, processes, which will involve a public comment period, uh, which I hope all of you will be willing to um, provide feedback on. And so the contact information that Kate put in the chat would be a way, <clears throat> excuse me, to reach out to us if you um, have feedback or I think more importantly for this group, if you are representing an association, an organization or a group of colleagues who would have interest in this rule or would potentially be impacted by it, then we would welcome you to reach out to us uh, and, and give us your organization name to make sure that we provide a rule draft to you when that time comes. Obviously, the main groups we'll, we'll, we'll have on our radar, but um, we just want to be sure to try and get this out to as many as many potential stakeholders as possible. And I would envision uh, that this would be happening within, certainly within the next six months. Uh, Kate and I are in the process of doing deep dives into different sections of this rule to try and um, to try and uh, get, get our thoughts together and, and get a proposal out to you all. So please be on the lookout for that. In general, <clears throat> the purpose for this update is that it uh, will update some of the language to better reflect the current federal animal disease traceability requirements and animal ID requirements. Um, we're looking at uh, livestock import uh, disease testing requirements and trying to modernize some of, some of that information based on uh, updated versions of, of disease vector prevalence and that type of thing. Um, and then also there's a fair bit of just redundancy in the rule that we think we can clean up and make it a little bit of an easier of an easier read. So those are the primary purposes behind our effort at this point. And um, so that's what I will say about that. We are not planning to expand the rule into any other species that are not currently covered. But I think for those of you on this call, the species that you would be most interested in or, or be most closely working with, which are the dairy species are already covered in the rule and they will be continued. We will continue to keep them covered in the rule, but we're not um, expanding out into 
other other areas like dogs and cats and, and things such as that. So um, be on the lookout for that. And uh, if you want to share with us your organization name or make sure that you get information uh, proactively, then please feel free to, to contact us via the information in the chat. Uh, the other item that I will just briefly touch on is a little bit of a, of a shameless plug, I guess, but we uh, have started over the past year have developed a uh, newsletter similar to what uh, Laura Ginsburg with our agricultural development division mentioned. Uh, this newsletter is is quarterly. It's called uh, Field Notes, and uh, we are pleased to be able in it to highlight uh, the work that the Food Safety Consumer Protection Division does and the way it fits into your lives. And I mention it here because um, there's at least one article in every newsletter on on uh, Vermont dairy. <clears throat> so it might be something that you're interested in, and I can put that uh, way to subscribe to that newsletter in the chat after this. And it looks like Kate already did that. So if you're interested in subscribing and you don't currently receive it, then fe feel free to um to to do that and then um diane one last thing because this has just evolved in in the very recent last couple of days slash weeks uh some of our vermont dairy farmers also may have uh chickens and poultry <laughs> and so uh some of you may have been following the recent developments with high path avian influenza and some of the detections there have been wild bird detections of this this communicable disease within the new england region and uh as well as a detection for the first time since 2020 in a uh, turkey a um, commercial turkey flock in indiana fortunately not vermont indiana but uh, as a result of this we are, I guess I would say, on high alert uh, for trying to prevent this disease from being introduced into Vermont's um, wild birds or, or uh, domestic poultry. And I mention it here because, again, some dairy farmers within Vermont have sort of a, a side backyard poultry flock or hobby flock or something of that nature. And I, I just want to bring this to your attention to make this group aware of the fact that should we be faced with an avian influenza detection here in Vermont, then um, we, we unfortunately aren't in a position to be able to consider a backyard or hobby flock of poultry really any differently than a, you know, a larger commercial flock. So um, if there are dairy farmers who have poultry in Vermont, then uh, they're going to kind of be netted into some of the impacts of this response. Um, so this is similar messaging as to what we got out in 2015, 2016, when the last significant outbreak uh, happened in the Midwest, and we're reiterating it here. Uh, the agency is working with the Department of Fish and Wildlife, as well as Department of Health, to issue a press release with some helpful tips and tools for how to prevent this introduction. And um, we would encourage the, the dairy sector to as needed, pay attention to this information as well. So that concludes my updates. And, and if you're wondering, uh, um, and I'll, I'll butt in here for a minute, Kristen, if you're wondering why on a dairy call we're talking about poultry, <laughs> that if high pathogen um, avian influenza is detected, the Agency of Agriculture plus USDA, not just the agency, puts in extremely strict quarantines. Nothing moves. The milk truck doesn't come. The grain truck doesn't come um, without scrubbing and cleaning, and and sometimes they don't come because it's a quarantine area. So this is not just wow, bummer. I got some chickens; they might get sick. The impact could be tremendous if we get this here in Vermont. So protecting yourself and your chickens for one, but two, if there is a an outbreak in Vermont, in somebody's backyard chickens, or in we do have some commercial flocks. The quarantine areas are big and they are extremely strict. So that concern level of that's why we're talking about chickens during a dairy meeting that you may want to reconsider having that backyard fun flock of chickens maybe, uh, but also be cautious if you're visiting friends that have chickens and you want to pet the chicken and don't bring don't pet the chicken and bring it home. Um, so think about those things. Um, clearly around what's going on with with your dairy herd just because you got some backyard chickens. So be thoughtful. I'm not saying get rid of your chickens, but just be really thoughtful. Last time this was scary stuff. 
Um, so just want to, that's why we're talking about chickens during a dairy call. So of course we have gone over quite well and it appears that I was a bit overzealous in my agenda. So thanks everybody for hanging in there. Our next call is on the 16th of February, noon to one, hopefully it'll fit within that hour. If not, we'll spill over a little bit, but thank you all for hanging in there. Uh, Kristen and Kate have put their contact information and I would encourage you strongly to sign up for the, um, newsletter as well. There'll be putting out further information on all sorts of topics. So thank you all. And um, this was recorded and uh, we'll make sure it's available for that you can share with others who couldn't take part today. So thank you very much. Bye everybody.